Good evening. I am Betsy Stites, the president of the Woodbury Cottage Grove League of Women Voters. The purpose of our league, both at the state, the national, and the local level, is to empower voters and defend democracy. And believe it or not, we've been doing this for over 100 years. We are a trusted source for nonpartisan voter registration and education and a longstanding witness to Minnesota's proud tradition of voter access and election integrity. The League's mission is to encourage informed and active participation of citizen involvement, to work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. And we do that through things like our candidate forums that we're having tonight, promoting voter registration, and also informing voters on important public policy in, uh, through education. Uh, we invite you to visit our website, lwvmn.org, to learn about statutes, best practices, and safeguards associated with Minnesota elections. And we really want you um, to know about our vote, 411. All, Minnesota is one of only three states in the nation where we ask every single candidate throughout the state to answer a set of questions so that you, the uh, voter, can be informed. Please go to Vote 411 to learn more about the wonderful candidates that you're going to hear tonight. Tonight, we are uh, welcoming the candidates for Senate District 47 and House District 47 A and B. And I'm going to turn it over to Liz Nordlin, who is our moderator. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. The League of Women Voters, Woodbury Cottage Grove, welcomes you to this virtual forum for the candidates in the November election for Senate and House districts, House candidates in District 47. My name is Liz Nordling. I'll be moderating this forum tonight, and I do not live in District 47. Tonight, we will be exploring candidates' answers to topics related to education, budget and finance, public safety, health care, elections, climate and equity, providing an opportunity for them to respond to questions submitted to the League of Women Voters by members of the public. The order for speaking tonight will begin in alphabetical order by race and will be rotated thereafter. Candidates' remarks are being timed to assure equality of time. All candidates have been invited to participate. The candidates participating in tonight's forum are for Senate, District 47, Dwight Dora and Nicole Mitchell. For House District 47A, Amanda Hemmingson Yeager and Bob Lawrence. For House District 47B, Kelly Fenton and Ethan Cha. We will begin with opening statements and we will start with Di Dwight Dora. Okay, well thank you and good evening everybody. I'm Dwight Dora and I'm humbled and honored to be running for the Minnesota State Senate. I'd like to first say thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this outstanding forum. And I'd especially like to thank those of you who are turn, tuning in tonight to watch this great event. It's people like you who care about our state that mean so much to me. And I want to be sure to represent you well if you choose to send me to the Senate. Very briefly, I was born and raised in Minnesota, attended public schools and colleges, Spent 27 years as an Air Force officer and combat flying squadron commander, and I currently teach Air Force Junior ROTC at Johnson High School in inner city St. Paul. Most importantly, I'm a dad and a role model to three grown children who have turned out to be very amazing citizens. I'm excited to share my ideas about serving you as our next senator. Thank you again for your attention tonight. Thank you. Now with your opening statement is Nicole Mitchell. Hi, I'm Nicole Mitchell. Thank you also to the League and everyone that is following us here tonight. Um, I care deeply about this community. My family, including me, moved here in 1986. This is where I grew up. This is where I went to school. While I moved away for work, I moved back here to raise my family because I grew up in the public schools here, and I want to make sure they're amazing for our children. I love the parks and the trails and the people, and I want to maintain those things also for our future generations. I too served in the military, still serving, 
30 years as a veteran. In fact, if I make it to the Senate, I will be the first female veteran in over a decade. I'm a mom and a foster parent, and as I said, I value our public schools, including for our special needs students like my foster son. And I'm a meteorologist who understands climate and environmental issues, and I wanna preserve those things. Thank you for your consideration tonight. Thank you. Next with her opening statement is Amanda Hemmingson Yeager. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum tonight, and thank you everybody out there watching. My name is Amanda Hemmingson Yeager, and I am running for the Minnesota House of Representatives, District 47A, which are the com communities of South Maplewood and Woodbury. I'm a mom and a scientist, and I wanna advocate for working families of all generations. I want to use my education in genetics and policy, my professional experience as a legislative analyst, and stories shared by the community to invest in education, because families deserve access to quality education, no matter their zip code, their income, or background, to address climate change, because we need to protect the planet for future generations, and everyone deserves clean air, water, and soil, and to champion healthcare, because all Minnesotans deserve access to affordable healthcare and paid time away from work to care for themselves and their family. Thank you. Thank you. Now with this opening statement is Bob Lawrence. Good evening. I'm Bob Lawrence, and I'm running for Minnesota House in District 47A, which represents Woodbury and South Maplewood. My wife Stacy and I have been married for 22 years, and we have lived here in Woodbury for 17 of those years. Our son Bobby is a sophomore at Marquette, and our daughter Bree is a senior at Hill Murray. The support of my family gives me the strength and fortitude to pursue this position. Yesterday, September 11th, was a reminder of the evil that is in the world and the ultimate sacrifice that so many Americans made on that day and the 7,670 <clears throat> days that have passed since then. But today is the anniversary of a great day in our country, September 12, 2001. It was a day that all Americans came together, a day that we realized what we share is much greater than our differences. I believe we can get back to that mindset of that day. We all want the same results, safe communities, good jobs, our children to have a solid education, take care of the environment, and most importantly, take care of each other. Thank you. Now with this opening statement is Ethan Cha. First of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women's Voters for uh, having me here tonight and create this opportunity for each and every one of us. My name is Ethan Cha, and I'm running for Minnesota House 47B. I'm running to preserve, to protect, and to ensure that the systems we put in place will work for all of us, regardless of race, religion, and class. I care deeply about the state of my community because I care about the environment. I care about women's reproductive rights, and I care about the education of our young children in public school systems. I'm running to ensure to protect working class families and to ensure that all voices will be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Now with her opening statement is Kelly Fenton. Thank you to the League and to those tuning in now and later for your engagement. I'm Kelly Fenton. I'm a Woodbury mom, wife, former educator, community volunteer, and now once again, I want to be your voice as Woodbury's state representative at the Capitol. We all know that Woodbury is one of the best communities in the nation to live. 20 years ago, my husband and I chose Woodbury for our family because of its great schools, thriving local businesses, and a community that is united and strong. But the last few years have been hard on Minnesotans in all parts of the state. As I've knocked on thousands of doors, I've heard your concerns. I will work hard to deliver tax cuts for families and permanently end the tax on social security for our seniors. I'll support our law enforcement and make sure we crack down on violent and repeat criminals with tougher penalties. I'll make sure strong, we have strong schools with a focus on academics and that Woodbury continues to be the best place to live, work, and raise a family. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to questions. First question is going to be on education and it goes to Kelly first. If elected, what would you do to ensure that the funding of our public schools adequately keeps up with inflation and growth? 
So thank you very much for this answer because it's uh, an issue that we've heard over and over again that there hasn't been enough funding in the schools. We haven't fully funded the schools. In this last budget, the state gave a $525 million increase. Uh, we also had $2 billion in COVID relief related funding. I, I've always, I was once at the legislature and I've not been there for a while, but I've always supported funding our education. So we need, every child deserves a great education no matter where they live. We also need to make sure parents are informed, involved, and empowered to make the best education decisions. But we need to make sure also that uh, as funding, that we also have the match of the cross subsidies. The federal government has not lived up to the means and we need to lean on them to also match. But we definitely, um, and I just ask, what is fully funded? What is that number? We need to know that so we can get there. Thank you. The question now goes to Bob Lawrence. Thank you. Yeah, and so to piggyback a little bit on what Kelly said, her last thing was the, the first thing that I've asked multiple times is I just would like, I'm, I've owned a business most of my adult life. And so we, I operate on a budget. We look at metrics. And so throwing money at any problem without knowing how we're gonna decide whether or not uh, we've had success is usually doesn't give you a good result. So I would like to understand what fully funded means. Uh, we spend half of our state budget on education, approximately $13,500 per kid right now. Uh, so we wanna make sure that the money that's going in, we're getting good results in math, science, English, second language would be wonderful. Uh, so that we're preparing our kids to go out into the world and be successful. Thank you. Thank you. The question now goes to Dwight Dora. And I will remind you that the question asks, what will you do to ensure that the funding of our public schools adequ adequately keeps up with inflation and growth? Hmm. Well, thank you for that question. Um, you know, when I started running for this position, uh, I decided to do something maybe a little uh, off the wall, but I actually read the Minnesota State Constitution. And uh, it's Article 8, Section 1, states that the, the state legislature has the responsibility to fully fund our education. And I tell you, I've been out for about four months now knocking on doors. I've knocked on hundreds of doors. And whenever education comes up, it's not necessarily about inflation. It's not necessarily about how much the spending is. It's mostly about parental choices and options. So we may never know the exact amount that we need to have. And that's a, a, a debate that very common sense, logical legislators can have. But, uh, but I don't think that's the top issue at this point as it comes to education. Thank you. The question now goes to Ethan Shaw. All the students in the state of Minnesota deserve a world-class education that's fully funded by the state. What does it mean to fully fund education? It means to hire the necessary amount of teacher, to have adequate classroom spaces, is to ensure that we have enough counselors and staff to protect our future, to ensure that the future of Woodbury will have equitable education for all children. Thank you. Thank you. The question now goes to Amanda Hemmingson Lieger. Thank you. When I was in eighth grade, um, my school district had their first on, only school board referendum, our school referendum to just keep the lights on in my school. And it was very rare. And it was supposed to be just like a one-time thing. And now as I go on doors and I live in this community, I see that we have more regular referendums and levies. So when I think about that, my science brain kicks in. And I think, what is happening systemically that maybe we need to address? <coughs> 
So I go back and with my science brain, I would love to look at the state funding formula and see what we need to do to make sure that our schools are adequately funded, to make sure that our schools receive the necessary resources to be fully staffed, that teachers are supported, that we keep up with inflation so that the parents do not bear the brunt of these increases. And yes, thank you. Thank you, the question now goes to Nicole Mitchell. Um, first, I want to piggyback on what Amanda said, which is when we are not fully funding our schools, we have problems like we have now where more communities have levies and bonds to try and fill that gap. This needs to be coming from the state because not every community can afford to do that. And we need to make world-class education for every student. Um, I disagree with uh, my opponent, for example, who is a, a voucher proponent funneling our, private, our public school funds and our public tax dollars into private schools. We need to invest in our public schools because those are the schools for everyone. They take care of our low-income students, our English as a second language students, children like my foster son who needs special education. Often these private schools don't have requirements to help students like that. Um, they provide busing and school lunches and so many services. And we've been starving them with services like counseling and teachers. We need smaller classroom and more support. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Yes, Dwight? Yes, I would just like to say uh, for the record that I am not a voucher proponent. The Minnesota State Constitution does not allow vouchers or public money to go to religious schools, for example. And so I am not in favor of that. I am in favor of fully funding our public schools, absolutely. And maybe for some parents who choose different options for their children, I am in favor of higher tax deductions for them. Thank you. Anyone else? I would like to clarify, I got that information based on a video with him and the um, uh, Scott Johnson, so I am basing that off of information that was online. Thank you. Anyone else? Jensen, sorry. We'll move on to the next question. It goes to Nicole Mitchell first, and it's a question on the budget. The 2022 legislative session ended with no action on the remaining $7.2 billion state surplus. What do you believe the state should do with that surplus? Oh, so many things, right? Um, first of all, I, I think it was disgraceful not more action happened on that because we had things like federal matching funds, uh, $100 million for infrastructure. So if we would have funded some of the infrastructure, more of that would have come into our state as well. So it's ridiculous that we would leave money on this, the table. And I know we've been asking the Democrats for a special session to try and address some of these things. So we just got done talking about our public schools. Um, I ran out of time, but some of the things that our public schools need is here in Woodbury, for example, we've been growing so quickly, we're running out of classroom space. So we need more running, money for school infrastructure. Our counselors are one to 250 um, is what it should be. In some schools, it's one to four or 500. So we need more of that support. We also need, um, as I said, the infrastructure is the roads, and I'd like to see more investment in our environmental issues. Thank you. The question now goes to Kelly Fenton. Thank you. Um, there was an agreement to put a third into the rainy day fund, a third uh, in investment, and a third in tax cuts for the people. The reason that that uh, did not get done is because somebody else, uh, the House Democrats went in to try to make additional deals. I do believe we need to be very judicious regarding the surplus. We need to continue funding the rainy day fund. We also need to offer our seniors on fixed income tax exemption from Social Security. That was part of the deal that did not get done. And a tax bill can only start in the House. And we need to consider other investments, um, such as bonding. We didn't have a bonding bill, and we, um, those are jobs. And we need to look at investment and bonding. That's what we could do with our surplus. Thank you. The question now goes to Bob Lawrence. 
Yeah, thank you. So I think now the surplus is somewhere around 13 billion. Um, and yeah, I, I would agree that uh, as a business, the first person you pay is yourself. So we should be taking a good share of that money and putting it for a rainy day fund, having it so that uh, when something comes up that we can take care of it. We should be investing in uh, law enforcement. We need to have, I mean, we're short officers all across the state and we can see it from uh, the increase in crime is, is uh, dramatic. And we also should be putting money to infrastructure. Uh, was 16 years ago that uh, the 35W bridge collapsed at a high school, um, one of my high school buddies died on that bridge. And we were very concerned about infrastructure then, that's kind of fallen by the wayside. Uh, we still have roads, bridges, our water system, several things that needed to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, the question now goes to Dwight Dora. Yes, can, uh, can you please state the first part of that question again? The 2022 legislative session ended with no action on the right. remaining $7.2 billion state surplus. What do you believe the state should do with that surplus? Okay, so uh, thank you for that clarification. I think that the current state legislature should do nothing with that. They passed a budget. That budget was approved by Democrats and Republicans and the governor. All of this money is extra. So this extra money should be spent by those of us who are elected into the legislature this time. And I don't mean all of it. There are some good things that we can spend this money on, education, infrastructure, absolutely. But I also think a share of this needs to go back to the hardworking Minnesotans who overpaid, and it's their money. The government's money is the taxpayer's money, and they're the ones who were overcharged, and some of that money needs to get back to them. My recommendation there is some modest tax cuts to help people with this inflation that is out of control so that hardworking Woodburyans and South Maplewood people have more money in their pocket for, this, for these hard times. Thank you. The question now goes to Ethan Shaw. With the surplus at this uh, Minnesota state level, there are three or maybe four things that I believe that it should go towards. Number one is to hardworking families to get them back on their feet through this pandemic and this hardship that we have um, lived through in the last two years. Number two is infrastructure of the state of Minnesota. It's an important investment to uh, transportation, broadband, and to all who live here in Minnesota. Number three is climate change. Climate change is real. It's happening, and it is happening here in Minnesota. And number four, it should be invested into the education, whether it is for earlyhood child or post-education. We need to invest in the education of all Minnesotans. Thank you. Thank you. The question now goes to Amanda Hamilton Yeager. Thank you. I believe a budget is a reflection of our values. And as a legislative analyst, I watched the hearings take place um, during session last year. And I found myself frustrated <clears throat> because I felt that people were on one side, people were on the other, and Minnesotans mostly in the middle were being left out. Um, I believe that we need to come together to compromise, to listen, to understand, and do what's best for Minnesotans. We have an opportunity here to address so many issues and so many things and catch things up in an equitable way. We need to catch up on our school funding to make sure our students, our teachers, and our educational professionals are supported. We need to address climate change so we can move into the future, creating new jobs to move Minnesota to the next step. And we need to address health care so families don't have to choose between paying a medical bill and putting groceries, so that seniors don't have to worry about will they get their next medication. So we have a chance to do a lot. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? <clears throat> and we'll move on to the next question, and it goes to Amanda first. It's on public safety. Many are concerned with increased gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, would you support to help reverse this current trend and respond to the need for safer communities? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, 
I am actually a former forensic scientist and have experience working alongside law enforcement. They are a vital part of our community and they need our support. However, we also need to make sure that people also feel safe in their community. And one way of doing that is by addressing gun violence. Um, I have been looking into and researching gun safety through a Moms Demand Action and through Protect Minnesota, looking at research and data-driven um, analyses to make sure that whatever legislation we pass is done so in a thoughtful and comprehensive way. Two of uh, the legislation that went through last session were things called like red flag laws, which means that someone can raise a red flag if they feel that there is a concern with a family member that might hurt themselves or others with a gun. Another one is expanded background checks so that we make sure that people who own these guns are not going to use them to harm other people. Thank you. Thank you. The question now goes to Bob Lawrence. Thank you. Could you repeat the question again, please? Many are concerned with increased gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, would you support to help reverse this current trend and respond to the needs for safer communities? Thank you. We have a tremendous amount of gun laws on the books right now. Um, I have, I'm, I coach TRAP. I'm a member of the Oakdale Gun Club. I've been a concealed carry uh, since they passed the law in Minnesota. So I've, I've gone through the purchasing process multiple times. And nobody is walking in and just buying a gun off the shelf without going through an FBI NICS check or if it's a handgun without getting a per permit to purchase. What we have is a problem with criminals that are being let out on the streets after they have already shown a propensity to violence. Again, those laws are on the books. I think the sentencing guidelines need to become mandatory for certain violent crimes so that and then we have to hold the county attorneys liable for putting them, for following these laws and making sure that the guys that we've already, that have already, the men and women that have already shown a propensity for violence, we're not letting back on the street. Thank you. The question now goes to Kelly Fenton. Thank you. Um, you know, I am a victim of assault when I was 15 years old and had a law abiding trained gun owner not been there. I might not be here to tell the story, but it does etch a scar on, in your every core. But right now, 21.6% rise in violent crime in the last year. And what we're seeing are the consequences of calling to defund the police. We have appointed judges are letting violent criminals off with a slap on the wrist and sentencing guideline commissions that are appointed by our governor actively work to reduce sentences for repeat criminals. So what to do? We need stronger penalties for repeat and violent criminals. Our prosecuting attorneys need to aggressively go after these criminals. Minneapolis needs to bolster police, their police force because we have a Minneapolis-St. Paul criminal problem coming here Thank into you. our community. Thank you, your time's up. Well, the question now goes to Nicole Mitchell. Um, I do think we, like Amanda, need to add some common sense gun legislation. Um, you know, I'm in the military. I shoot two different types of guns. I understand them. And, and no one is trying to take them away from law-abiding citizens. But almost everyone, Democrats and Republicans alike, agree that we should have universal background checks. Yes, you're getting checked if you go to a store. But person-to-person -person sales do not have them. And the top two ways that criminals get guns are called straw purchases. So someone asks uh, someone with a clean record to get them a gun, which is illegal, but it's hard to prove because they can say, I just didn't know. Or they go to a personal sale and just buy it. So the universal background checks would reduce that. Red flag laws would take mental health issues off the table. I have kids in school. I want them to be safe. Uh, Democrats in the last year have also tried to do salary increases for police. I agree with that. And public safety grants to make our communities safer. I also agree with that. Thank you. The question now goes to Dwight Dora. So ladies and gentlemen, the reason I'm here today is because a very close family member of mine was violently carjacked two years ago. I would not be here if it weren't for the events that happened after that in my life. And this is my number one priority, and you can count on me for public safety. 
I'd like to say that the very first article of the Minnesota State Constitution states that the, that the object of government is instituted for the security, benefit, and protection of the people. And that's what we need to do. We don't need any calls to defund our police. I've spoken to dozens of law enforcement professionals from the BCA, Washington County, Woodbury, Maplewood, and I know what they need. I'm running out of time here. I'll talk more about that in a future session here. Thank you. The question goes to Ethan Cha. Can you uh, ask the question? Many are concerned with increased gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, would you support to help reverse this current trend and respond to the needs for safer communities? As a survivor and a victim of gun violence a dozen times over, you know, gun violence holds a very close piece to my family and the history of my upbringing. I believe in common sense gun laws. As a rancher, a gun owner, I understand the rights to bear arms, but I do understand that we need more common sense gun laws. Gun safety correlates to public safety in our schools for our children. I want to protect my children, your children, and the schools, the teachers, for all of our community. And as your legislator, I will continue to pass legislation that will make sense to protect the people that we care about. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Then we'll move on to the next question, and it goes to Ethan first. Given the recent Supreme Court ruling regarding Roe versus Wade, state legislatures may be enacting new laws regarding women's reproductive health issues, including access to care. What measures, if any, do you think the Minnesota legislature should enact regarding women's reproductive health and abortion? My mother, my daughter, and my sisters did not have access to health care in our country. Women's reproductive right is the rights of each and every woman in this nation. It must be protected. These rights belong to women. The reproductive rights, the access to health care is a right that Ethan Cha will uphold in the state of Minnesota and defend and protect our women, sisters, mothers, and grandmothers. Thank you. Thank you. The question now goes to Kelly Fenton. Could you repeat the question, please? Given the recent Supreme Court ruling regarding Roe versus Wade, state legislatures may be enacting new laws regarding women's reproductive health issues, including access to care. What measures, if any, do you think the Minnesota legislature should enact regarding women's reproductive health and abortion? Thank you very much. Um, this is a great question because there needs to be an education here in Minnesota on this. Minnesota is unique is that it is not an issue that the legislature will be addressing. Why is that? There is a Supreme Court decision that establishes abortion as a constitutional right here in Minnesota. This means that as a legislature, um, as, a legis as a legislator, I would have no authority to change it. Um, I'm gonna, but don't take my word for it. I'm going to quote Attorney General Keith Ellison uh, when the ruling came out. On June 24th, he said, SCOTUS has overturned Roe, but in Minnesota, your right to choose is protected and that's not changing. He also went on to say in a video, your Minnesota, in Minnesota, your right to seek a safe legal abortion is preserved and that's not about to change. That has to do with the case called Doe v. Gomez from 1995. So I um, would have no purview as a legislator to touch it. Thank you. The question now goes to Nicole Mitchell. Uh, so I'm a lawyer, I don't practice, but um, that is absolutely untrue. This is on the table in Minnesota. Um, we heard all those Supreme Court justices when they were before 
You know, their confirmation hearings, swearing under oath, Roe versus Wade is settled law, it, it, nothing's gonna happen to it, it's precedence. And then the second they had the chance, they went after it. The Republican governor candidate has said he will go after it, and when he found out women were mad and were voting, then they backtracked and said, oh, oh, it's settled. Yes, Minnesota has a Supreme Court state level ruling. It doesn't mean an attorney general can't go after it. It doesn't mean the legislature can't try and change things or amend the Constitution. I completely support a woman's right to choose. Every person should be able to decide when and if they're going to be a parent. I almost died with a planned parent pregnancy, and we have to let women make these medical decisions. Thank you. The question goes to Amanda Hemmingson Yeager. Thank you. We are in a very interesting time where I have more rights to choose my medical care than my daughters do. And that's not right by me. Um, abortion is a part of health care. It is a very difficult decision that a woman makes with her support structure and with her provider. I've seen bill introductions limiting access and limiting rights to reproductive care. So we cannot rely on a Supreme Court ruling. We learned that with what happened with Roe v. Wade. So we need to codify it into state law to make sure that those rights are protected. And finally, these types of sensitive and very personal medical decisions, there's no place for legislators to be inserting themselves to make those decisions. Thank you. The question now goes to Bob Lawrence. Thank you. When Roe v. Wade got turned over, I took a long time to think about this, because um, to be honest with you, I didn't think it was probably going to be an issue that we were going to be discussing. And although my, if it was my daughter, I would do everything I could to encourage her to uh, complete the pregnancy, I do not feel it is my job or my place to tell other women that they can't. Um, so the law as it sits in Minnesota right now, I think is how it should stay. Um, that's it, keep it as it is. Thank you. Question now goes to Dwight Dora. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm going to be the geek again that brings us back to the Minnesota Constitution. Uh, to change this constitutional right that we have in Minnesota, you need to present it to the people. That means all of the citizens of Minnesota if you wanted to make a change, and it would get put on the general election ballot, and we would all have a chance to change it to whatever the proposal was. And based upon my recent news watching of the state of Kansas, which is considerably more conservative than Minnesota, even seeing that it failed there, I doubt that this law would be overturned in Minnesota. So once again, I'm leading us back to that, um, I do agree, getting back to women's health, I agree that there are many issues here and I'm willing to work with common sense people to help promulgate better health care for women. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Yes, Amanda. Um, I would just like to reiterate that it, it is a very salient issue. I watched women senators on the floor talk about their experiences and talk about bills and if it was not going to be on the table to be voted upon in a bill cycle, then there wouldn't be discussing that. So I've seen the bill introductions and I just want to reiterate that it is a very important issue that I will fight for. Thank you. Ethan? Women's reproductive rights are on the line for the state of Minnesota and for every woman in this state. The reason Ethan Cha is running for office for the Minnesota House is to protect my three daughters, your daughters, your mothers and grandparents. Reproductive women's rights is at risk and we must act now as a state. Thank you. Thank you, anyone else? Dwight. Yeah, I would like to just reply to that. If it's such an important thing right now, um, then if, and if it's already a constitutional right as observed by the ruling that Kelly Fenton just talked about from 1995. What else can you do to bolster it to make it harder? I mean, it's already set in stone. 
what what options are there for you to make this a more powerful law in Minnesota? Thank you, Ethan, you've already responded. Anyone else? Um, I will respond to that. So what had been the state law was actually expanded by the Supreme Court ruling. So much like Roe versus Wade caused a bunch of trigger laws around the country, we could legislatively make that expansion that the Supreme Court gave permanent. That way, if the Supreme Court ruling in Minnesota is overturned, we go back to the legislature with the expanded laws. And I would like to note, there are people here who did not answer their stance on abortion, and I find that upsetting. Bob and Kelly are the only two who haven't responded. Do you have any comments? Then we're gonna move on to the next question. And this question goes first to Kelly. What is your position on ensuring that all Minnesotans have access to affordable health care? Thank you very much. Um, there are several things that we could do and uh, things that I actually supported when I was at the legislature. One thing I supported was the reinsurance, which saved and stabilized the individual market and stopped the double digit rate increases. I also supported legislation to bring more insurance options to families and boosted competition, which brought costs down. Currently, I support efforts to finally rid, uh, get rid of the 3.5% uh, minsure tax, which would save families millions on premiums. I support getting rid of the sick tax, which the Democrats raised last year, that taxes all medical procedures. So those are some uh, big things that we can do that to, can help healthcare be more affordable to families. Thank you, the question now goes to Dwight Dora. Um, yes, I, I agree with Kelly that we do need to get rid of that uh, Minsure tax because that equals millions of dollars in the long run. And I also agree that the uh, state reinsurance needs to be continued. Um, I also think that right now in the marketplace, it's a really good time for uh, employees. Employers are having a very hard time finding the required numbers of employees, and you can really uh, work out some good um, benefits packages for health care and numer you know, dental care, other things like that. And, uh, and of course, yes, do we always need to have a good financial net to catch people at, at the lower end who maybe can't afford it? Absolutely. So maybe uh, some public-private partnerships are awesome ideas. I know companies like 3M and others have done things like that in the past. So uh, so healthcare is important to Minnesotans. So I look forward to working with very common sense people to come up with good solutions for this. Thank you. Thank you. The question now goes to Amanda Hemmingson Yeager. I have two uncles. Um, one of my uncles is uh, very wealthy. Um, he had his own special suite at a very prestigious hospital. He had a terry, bath cloth, terry cloth robe. Um, very well taken care of in that regard for his health care. I have another uncle who is not wealthy, well off at all. He needed a life-saving drug, which cost $500. He doesn't have $500. He went to the pharmacy and was turned away. And when he called my mom, basically told her, I thought I was gonna go home and die. Um, thankfully, someone was in that pharmacy to help find a more generic drug, and he is still alive today. But that is a glaring, concern and a gl what is glaringly wrong with our healthcare system. We need to move towards a single payer healthcare system so our elders, our children, and our family are well taken care of. And we need to offer paid family medical leave so that people can take care of themselves and others as well. Thank you. The question now goes to Bob Lawrence. Uh, so healthcare obviously is, is very important to, to all of us, especially when we have families. Dwight's point is very good, and I, there are, right now we have so many opportunities for employment, and employers are offering great benefits. I've, I've been an employer for most of my adult life, and although I don't offer health care, I've offered to help people, help people find it, so I've, I've worked through 
the system and to make it reasonable so that they can afford it. Um, the less that government institutes programs, the more efficient things become. I think that it's important for people to have an option, as Amanda brought up, to have uh, paid medical leave, but there are private opportunities for that. Uh, just like there are private opportunities for disability insurance, private opportunities for life insurance, and private companies do a better job administering that. Thank you. The question goes to Nicole Mitchell. Um, I think health care should be a fundamental right. <clears throat> and especially when we invest in it early and people know that they can go and be covered, it keeps little things from turning into much bigger, more expensive things. Uh, in my career, I had a career where I, I moved around the country for a while, worked for a lot of different private companies. I can tell you that healthcare coverage can vary wildly from company to company. Um, and, and now I'm covered by my work through the guard. But even that, I found during a high-risk pregnancy, for example, there was a medication I need that they said, eh, we're just not covering that one. And there was no way to appeal it. And it was one of those things that had cost $20 to make that a company had jacked up the price to $1,500 a week. So I think we need to look at leveling the playing field so that more people have equitable quality health care and also work on continuing to reduce prescription prices. Thank you. The question now goes to Ethan Shaw. Health care is as essential as the air we breathe and the water that we drink. Health care is essential to healthy American families. Affordable health care is important to the seniors in our community to have affordable prescription access to health care and having cultural competent providers. All these things are important. And health care, again, is as essential as the air that we breathe and the water that we drink. And every person should have access to it. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Yes, Amanda. Uh, I'd just like to piggy off, piggyback off of Nicole's comments. Um, when we come together and when we have a more single-payer health care system and when we think about health care as a fundamental human right, we have the power to negotiate prices on medical procedures, on visits, and on prescription drug costs. Thank you. Anyone else? Kelly. I just want to bring up uh, one thing that I am very proud to have worked on that also helped bring down costs to patients, and that was step therapy reform, um, which I did pass at uh, the legislature. And basically what, that, what happens is insurance companies are telling the doctors how to treat the patient. And they say, you need to try this drug first. If it doesn't work, the patient needs to come back. Then they could try the second drug in the step, and they done work, then the third. I passed reform that allows the doctor to try the best drug first, um, meaning saving costs for the patient. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Ethan. I want to remind the voters that my opponent, Kelly Fenton, as a legislator, try to pass legislation to attack the Medicare Assistant Program to enforce people on MA to go back to work that would hurt their families and their livelihood. Let us remind ourselves. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> We're going to move on to the next question then. It goes to Dwight Dora first, mm -hmm. and it's on elections. As a member of the legislature, what measures, if any, would you support to reinforce reinforce or ensure voter confidence that our elections are secure and the results are accurate? So I'm going to assume that we're talking about in the state of Minnesota on this question. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And uh, my answer would be, um, I have full faith and confidence in the uh, election process in Minnesota. Should I win? or should I lose, I will respect those uh, results. Uh, I would like to see some form of voter identification. It would, you know, most Americans and most Minnesotans agree that that would be a good thing. Uh, 
virtually everybody I know, I can't think of anybody I don't know, has a, uh, an ID that they could use. I'm also recently been informed that you can actually get a free ID at different places in Minnesota, including government agencies. So I guess that would maybe be the one thing that I would uh, hope for, but just voting in the primary election, I know that we do it very, very well here in Minnesota, and uh, I'm happy with it the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. The question goes to Nicole Mitchell. Um, so I love elections. And I've been a uh, uh, election judge since 2018. I want everyone to vote. It's one of your rights. I hope you vote for me, but really, I just want you to go and vote. Um, there is not widespread voter fraud. Um, I don't think that should even be said because it's a lie to, to undermine our process. I have seen the process. If you wanna know more about it, go be an election judge and you will be so impressed. Um, Here's the thing, e even with voter IDs, you have your verification when you register. I have had people come to do same day registration, especially our seniors who do not any longer drive and have IDs. To fraudulently vote is a felony. This is not a problem. We should not make voting harder for people. In fact, I would say that when you get your driver's license, automatic registration. That's what I would add to make it even easier. Thank you. The question goes to Amanda, Amanda Hemingsgard. Can you please Hemingson Yeager? Can you please repeat it quick? Sure. Thank you. As a member of the legislature, what measures, if any, would you support to reinforce or ensure voter confidence that our elections are secure and the results are accurate? So my husband and my mother-in-law are both election judges, and the hearing their experiences, it's a very safe and fair process. We have over 80% voter turnout in the state of Minnesota. We have been number one in voter turnout for at least three years. That tells me that Minnesotans have confidence in our election system. Uh, two issues that I think would be great to even increase that even more, um, Nicole alluded to it, is automatic voter registration. It can be done when you renew your license upon 18 years old. Another one is voter res restoration. People who have paid their debt to society, have been considered rehabilitated and are now back in society, should have their right to vote restored. Thank you. Thank you. The question goes to Kelly Fanton. Uh, thank you. Um, I do believe that here in Minnesota, we have uh, fair elections. And yes, I do believe Joe Biden is our legitimate president. I think he convinced enough people that he was a moderate. And we've come to learn that that really wasn't the truth as we're dealing with high inflation and other consequences of policies. Um, if people want to have more confidence in our elections, I'm not a proponent of voter ID. That sounds like you need to be a member of some club, but I do believe it's not out of uh, the ordinary to request that people show a photo identification for voting. One thing that I would change though, and I think our early voting process is, is pretty secure. I worked with Secretary of State Steve Simon on this. I would like people to have the option if they want to go ahead and put their ballot in the lock tabulator themselves from the very start and rather than the envelope and handing that over. So that's one thing I'd do. Thank you. The question now goes to Ethan Cha. My mother came to America as a refugee. She studied night and day, two to three years, to ensure that she would get her citizenship. And for one purpose, she did this. It was so that she, as a newly citizen in the United States of America, could vote in the elections here in America. I believe in any policy and legislation to make voter access more accessible to our citizens. I support more translation programs and restoring, like what Amanda said, voting rights to those that have served and put time in incarceration. Thank you. Thank you. The question goes to Bob Lawrence. So 
my understanding from the question was that we're, the, the question is, is what can we do to make sure that the reinforce that our elections are fair in Minnesota? Uh, seems like everybody here agrees, and I haven't had the option to be an elector, or I haven't taken the opportunity, I'm sure I have the option, taking the opportunity to be an election judge. Um, but it's, the, it's perception is what counts. So there's some people that don't think they're fair or that there, there might be things going on. And that's why I don't think it's a, it's a big step to ask that you show some sort of photo identification when you come in to register. Um, it also just makes it really easy for the election judge, I would assume if I was an election judge, that I could see, look at an identification and see their face and see the name and I can look them up and yep, that's you, great, go ahead and vote. Doesn't seem like it would be restrictive to anybody. There's not a whole lot of things we can do in, in this world that we don't need some sort of identification for. So most folks, if not all, are carrying around some sort of identification. To Nicole's point, we could open up the AARP card with their picture on it for those that are done driving. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional comments? Yes, Kelly. I do want to just make the comment uh, because there have been a few um, indications that felons don't have voting rights once they commit a felony. That is not accurate. Um, our felons can absolutely have their voting rights restored once they serve their full sentence. So they do have the right once they do serve a full sentence, and I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I would like to add, I've actually gotten someone back when they've been out of jail and and gotten that right back, and, and that's a very special moment um, as an election judge. Again, if you don't have confidence, this is my plea, come be an election judge, we need more of them. And you'll see how great the process is. Um, but to the point of IDs, it, it, it wouldn't actually make our job any, any easier or different. We just want everyone to vote. People are vetted when they register. Um, and as I said, I know seniors and, and people who are low income and use public transportation don't have those IDs often. Thank you. Anyone else? I am sorry to say that that was our last question. <laughs> oh. So we are going to have to move on to closing. I know I've got questions on climate and environment and on childcare and additional health care questions. There, there's so many good questions. Mm. But we have to move to closing statements. And we are going to go in the reverse order. So we will start with House District 47B. And we'll go in the reverse order of opening statements. So we'll begin with you, Kelly. Thank you. I'm Kelly Fenton, and I am the only candidate in this race who has the proven leadership of working on all sides of the aisle for what is best for everyone. And I'm supported by business, law enforcement, trades, care providers, and farm. But most importantly, I will work for you. We need representation for the majority in the middle. I will work for common sense solutions that puts more money back into your pockets, ends the social security tax for our seniors. I will support tougher penalties for repeat and violent criminals. And I'll work hard to make sure that Woodbury is the best place to live, work, and raise a family. I'm Kelly Fenton, and I ask for your vote for state representative on November 8th. And I will add that early voting starts September 23rd. Thank you for participating and watching, and thank you again to the League of Women Voters for hosting this. Thank you. Next with his closing statement is Ethan Shaw. Hi, my name is Ethan Shaw, and I'm running for 47B State House Representative. Ethan Shaw is the recipient of the American dream. Ethan Shaw is running to protect and to serve that American dream. Come November 8th, Ethan Cha is asking for your vote, your trust in the transparency and integrity that he will provide in serving 47B at the Minnesota State House Legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will hear our two candidates for 47A, and we'll begin with Bob Lawrence. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and the candidates for this forum. It's almost better than Monday Night Football. We have this wonderful system where the people get to choose their representatives. So first and foremost, we all need to get out and vote on November 8th. 
I encourage people to take a few minutes, get to know their candidates. Talk to them when they knock on your door. Look at their website and social media. Call or email them with questions. And for sure, watch the candidate forum on the League of Women Voters website. I am offering to serve my district. And if the people of my district choose for me to represent them, I will carry out those duties with honesty and integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next with her closing statement is Amanda Hemmingson Yeager. Thank you. Thank you again to the League for hosting this forum. And thank you, Liz, for moderating. I would also like to thank the audience for watching and for your very thoughtful questions. My name is Amanda Hemmingson Yeager, and I want to truly represent and advocate for everyone in South Maplewood and Woodbury. I have the analytical thinking and professional experience to thoroughly evaluate and create comprehensive and effective policies. I'm a collaborative person who listens to understand, I gather multiple perspectives, and I intentionally engage with community to ensure that people are at the center of my policy decisions. I invite you to follow me on social media and visit my website, amandafornhouse.com, and I look forward to earning your vote this election season. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will hear the, from the two Senate candidates for Senate District 47, and we'll begin with Nicole Mitchell. I started this by saying that I grew up in this community and I care deeply about this community. Um, my parents taught me community service. My stepdad was 20 years on the Woodbury Fire Department, both served in the Minnesota National Guard. I'm still serving in the Guard. So service has always been something kind of in my blood, especially in this community. Um, working at the food shelf, helping as an election judge, being a census worker. Um, I'm not someone who just moved here a few years ago and, and really hasn't been involved. You guys, you guys know me. And um, those who know me know how much I care about this community and want to make lives better for everyone. Um, there's so much more to say that we can't have time for here today. So yes, I encourage you to go to our websites. Mine is NicoleMitchell.org. You can learn more about me, my endorsements, my policy positions. But as I said, I really do hope everyone gets out and votes, hopefully, you know, for us. But uh, please go vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next with his closing statement is Dwight Dora. Well, I just want to say thank you so much to the League of Women Voters tonight. This was a very well done production. Thank you so much. And I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for allowing me to share my ideas for a better Minnesota with you tonight. I've spent the last four months in your neighborhoods talking to hundreds of you. And overwhelmingly, you have told me that increasing crime and lack of public safety high gas and food prices and rampant inflation, and various issues with education, including parental involvement and choices, are your top concerns. Woodbury and South Maplewood residents, I hear you loud and clear, and I'm on the way to help. Thank you for your support and for your vote on November 8th. Together, we can help fix this mess we are in. Please contact me at DwightDora4MN.com if you have any questions or inputs. Good night, and God bless you. The League thanks the candidates for their participation, the City of Woodbury for the use of their facility, SWCTC for taping and broadcasting this event, our League volunteers, and you, the audience, for your attendance and interest. Let your voice be heard. Vote. Thank you and good night. This concludes our forum for uh, our candidates for District 47. Uh, we are really so appreciative, first of all of you, that you're running for office. Um, we know it's not easy, uh, but it's so critical. And you've heard how important getting out the vote is. Um, again, it's on South Washington uh, cable, both broadcast and live stream, uh, so people have an opportunity to see it um, over and over if you want. Uh, <laughs> we had over 3,000 um, viewings just last year, uh, which really says a lot. We have. Uh, this is the second of our eight candidate forums. Uh, we have one coming up at 8.15 tonight. Um, and then uh, we also have one tomorrow uh, for Senate District 41, uh, September 20th for Woodbury City Council, and the 21st for Senate and House District 53. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate being here.